Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Expeditions from Stonemaier Games. Expeditions is a 1-5 to five player game from Stonemaier Games, and is the uh, spiritual successor to Scythe. I don't think it's like an actual expansion, it's like more of a spiritual successor. It kind of takes place in the same universe, has the same art style, and uh, continues the world and all that stuff. And has small, small, small similarities in gameplay, but really, Expeditions is very much its own thing. If you liked Scythe, or if you love Scythe, you may not like Expeditions at all. And if you did not like Scythe, if you hated it, if it didn't work for you, or if you were like me, you were kind of okay with it, and that's it, Expeditions may still be a game for you. But with that way too long tangent about a different game that's not called Expeditions, let's talk about Expeditions. Expeditions is a 1-5 to five player game that is a tableau builder. This game is going to involve you trying to uh, build up your hand of cards. You're going to start with a leader and their associated pet or animal companion. Those are going to be the cards you're going to play. From there, you're going to be taking actions, both playing cards, moving around the board, and then activating the various tiles on the board, all while you explore new tiles over here, who I'm realizing now I did not put out the associated map tokens for. Let's go ahead and toss a few of those out as we go. But Basically, you're moving, playing cards, and taking the actions of various tiles, all as you play the game, and you're doing so to try to build out a better hand and tableau as you go through it to ultimately be the player who has the most points when game end is triggered. To that end, game end is going to be triggered when four of these things are accomplished. Players are going to have four stars, you're going to be using your four stars to be able to get certain things. So for example, just to use the most basic example, you start with two cards in your hand, once you get to eight cards over here, you can then go ahead and take a star and put it over here. There's more of a process to doing that, but let's pretend you can do it right away. You can't. You have to do something first. But if you have eight cards, you can now accomplish that. So over here, we're going to go ahead and say, look at that. I have eight cards in my hand, my discard area, my uh, play area. And to that end, I'm going to go ahead and say, I have that. Maybe as you explore the board, you go ahead and take actions, you move around the board, you go ahead and flip over map tiles, revealing new map tiles in the game over here. And then if we do that over here. We're going to put this down there. We're going to grab that. And then now we have a map token. As you have five of these map tokens, what you're going to do is you're going to be able to, once you have five over here, you put a star again over here get to put down a star now you also by the way when you reveal a map tile we do have to do something over here so let's just show you how that works we're going to go ahead and reveal five points worth of uh, little tokens in here that's a five right there we're good to go we're going to put that down there we'll leave that as is we'll come back to that but just showing you how the game progresses over here so in general you're trying to accomplish certain goals this part is going to be a little reminiscent of scythe in terms of the idea of having multiple possible things you can do over here you can have four quests the quests are going to be cards that go down here that is a quest card it has a heart when you accomplish it which we'll come back to later that's going to be four quests. Over here, you have four meteors. Some cards over here, none of the ones you currently see, but over here, we're going to have some cards that have meteors over here. Uh, this one over, we have meteors, I'm telling you. Here we go. Here's a meteor card. This meteor will be tucked underneath your board as you accomplish them, and those, if you have a bunch of meteors, you can go ahead and accomplish the meteors. We also have item cards. Item cards, we do have one on the board over here. This is an item card. As you build them, they get tucked to the side of your board. So effectively, you have a few different areas your cards are going as you play. Your hearts are tucked to the top of the board, your items to the side, and your meteors below, and as you have four four or four you're able to accomplish those quests one of the tiles will have a 20 point tile on it you see this five point tile one tile will have a 20 point tile on it if you get that and only one person can get that you accomplish that quest then over here this one is having seven of these other tiles these tiles range in value generally between three and five and as you gather those tiles as you defeat them which we'll talk more about later you'll be able to get those if you have seven of those then you can put this quest down and this quest is eight cards this quest is five map tokens or seven meeple workers you're gonna have meeple workers in the game you can try to get your hands on and you do want to get your hands on them and once you have seven of those again you accomplish that goal now all of these things do require you taking an additional step to like lodge your your acquisition of the goal so it's not immediate it's you have to earn the goal and then actually proceed to lock, lock it in place well we'll talk about it anyways that's what you're trying to do over there once a player has four of these all four stars put on the board that will trigger game end at which point you'll get points for the following you will get points for any points you acquired along the way any coins you acquired throughout the course of playing you're going to get these coins over here and that will give you you know those coins additionally you're gonna get points for the number of quests you have these quests over here which you can have up to four unless you have the asymmetric player board unless you have five but if you have four of those quests you're going to get points per quest uh, depending on the number of I'm sorry, I apologize. Depending on the number of quests you have, you'll get points per star. So, for instance, if you have at least three quests, you'll get 10 points per star. But if you have no quests, you only get five points per star. So those four stars you have are worth between 20 and 40 points, or less than 20 if you don't get the stars. Then past that, the cards you build over here, these item cards that you build on the side, have point values as well. That's going to be the point values you get over here. And then lastly, these cubes over here, these disc you rec rescue, are going to be worth two points each. And that's all the points. So in-game points, points for your stars, points for your items, and points for your um, little disc thingies. That's going to be how you win the game, get the most points. Past that, let's talk about how you actually play the game, because I think we skipped that part. So, the way you play the game, the turn structure, as it were, 
is that turn by turn, players are going to take actions based on this little disc over here. Your first action in the game, when you're all starting off at base over here, your very first action in the game is going to involve you taking your cube and put, taking all three of these actions, move, play, and gather, and then sliding your cube up, which we'll, we'll walk through our first turn. So for example, let's pretend we're gonna move and you can move up to three spaces. And I'm gonna move, you know what? I'm gonna move over here to be able to get my hands on a yellow worker. So I'm gonna move there. I'm actually yellow, so I'm gonna move over here. I'm gonna grab a yellow worker. That means I moved, because I moved to that location. I gathered, because I took the thing on the location, and that's an either or symbol. And now I'm going to play, I'm going to play one of these cards and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and play this card over here, Vesna. She's going to give me one of this guile over here. So I'm going to move my guile marker up one. These pre uh, additional markers here are if I already had one or two stars, I would get more resources by playing her. But right now I only have the I only have the one guile. Then this over here, if I place a blue worker, which let's pretend I started from scratch over here. Let's pretend I did a, you know, had, didn't have any workers. So I took a blue worker and then I play it along with the blue worker. I can now gain a face-up item or solve a quest. Solving a quest involves being at a place where that quest is. So I have to be on tile 11 to solve this quest, tile 5 to solve this quest, tile 5 is actually over here. So I can gather this quest and solve that, but I don't have that quest, and so instead, I'm going to gain a face-up item. So this is over here is an item, I'm going to take that item, I'm going to gain it, and that's going to go into my discard pile. In general, when you gather items, they go into your, you know, your, your in-play area, not really discard pile, your in-play area, where you can later reclaim them. From there, that's basically my three things. I moved, I uh, played a card, and I gathered, and you can do that in any order you want. When I'm done with that, we're going to go to the next turn. Other players will take their turns. A new card comes out to this little area over here. These are the cards you can try to gather or buy. This card is now in play, so let's put it over here. Along with the card I gathered is also in play. And now we're going to come back to my next turn. Let's pretend this mech walks over here, does their thing. This mech goes over here, does that thing. So areas of the board are being blocked off. On my next turn, I'm going to choose to move and gather. I will choose not to play. So what you're going to do is you're going to slide this cube up, and I will choose not to play, but rather move and gather. This cube will generally block your spots. So your first turn, you get to do three things, all three things. Subsequent turns, you only get to do two things until. But as far as right now, move and gather. I'm going to move over here, and I'm going to take this action, which lets me take the action of an associated spot. I'm going to look at this card, which requires a red meeple. So I'm going to use this action, which normally would be blocked, but because I'm using the adjacent action, I can take a red meeple, and we're done. Again, players will wander around. This person is also going to, this person is going to play and gather, so do that thing again. This person is going to move over here, flipping this over. It's worth noting you cannot go through unexplored regions. So even though you can move three, you can't actually go through regions, so he could not go to those spots there. From there, back to my turn. I could go ahead and play a card, but for the sake of showing you how things work, I'm actually going to take a refresh turn. Right now, if I wanted to, I could slide this along. You have to slide this. You cannot keep this in the same area. But I could go ahead and slide this over here, for example, and do play and gather right now, where I could play a card and gather, again, one of these bonuses over here, which I probably should do. You know, let's go ahead and do that. So over here, we're going to activate an adjacent face of cards ability, which is activate the ability of any face up item amongst the locations. So first, when I play this, I will gain that strength over there. I'll activate the card, which will activate this, and this activates the ability of any face up item amongst the locations. There are no face up among items, so I'm not going to do that. In fact, this card is actually kind of useless. So you know what? We actually will go ahead and refresh right now. So I'm going to take a refresh turn instead. Where what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull back all the cards and workers that I played. So right now over here, we're going to gather these cards, put the workers back in my supply. I now have three cards and this slides down to over here. Meaning effectively, the next time I take a turn, I can take all three actions, which basically means that when you take a refresh turn, you're giving up half a turn, not a full turn, because the turn after a refresh turn, you can take all three actions. Meaning instead of taking two, you're taking three, it works up to half an action per turn. Half an action, two actions per turn, and a refresh turn means you're only giving up one action, not two. That's basically it. You're going to do that over there. And that's the tableau building part of the game, to a large degree. That's the general turn cycle, I should say. As far as the tableau building it comes in a few different pathways. First of all, is as you explore the board, you're going to be unlocking various spots. One thing we didn't really talk about, we forgot to do over here. We're going to draw cubes, corruption effectively, from these spots over here. And that's again a five plus. We're going to put it over here. You could cover these spots up. I usually leave them a bit off center so I can see what's underneath at all points. There is an outline in place. You can look at the color. I find it's easier to just have them a little bit offset. Everyone can see at the table what's going on a little bit better. But past that, as you explore these regions, you're going to be gathering these map tiles. Map tiles are good because they will help you get that point over there, which helps you in the game. As you gather cards, you're going to be gathering quests, items, and meteors, which they're all quests right now. Uh, quests give you the ability to solve them. When you have a quest card, if you go to location 5, then once you're at location 5, you can take a solve action from any card that lets you take a solve action. You can trade in the resources shown there, so I can trade in one guile. I will get a strength. And then as well as that, this card will now slot underneath my board. 
where it is now worth, but it's going to be worth both an endgame trigger once I get four of them, but also as a factor in how much my stars score as I play. You want to continuously put out new cards. There's so many quests on the board. So that's why you want quests. Quests are going to help improve your endgame score and also give you a victory condition. Meteors, on the other hand, meteors have a few aspects going for them. Let's go ahead and find some meteors over here. Where are my meteors again? They were here before. Over here, we're going to have a meteor. Meteors give you a few different benefits to why you want them. The first is the fact that as you have meteors in play, they will give you more resources. So right now you can see this will give you one guile but it'll give you two if you already have a meteor in play so as you play meteors these cards can be great at generating resources for you which are very important we'll talk about why in a second but then additionally as you build these meteors out you're going to get points in the game for the various things so it's going to give you a variety of things get points for every green card i think that's actually it nope they gain one one point per four value corruption tile you have get points for every green card get points for the tiles for the cards around you where you are on the board you're going to get points for different things as you play these meteors and whenever you play a meteor you activate all previous meteors two so it gets escalatingly more powerful up until you can build four meteors you can have four quests four meteors and four uh, items in play at any given time there is one faction whose ability is you can have five five and five which is very cool but past that you're going to be getting those meteors which will give you uh, ongoing points as you as you play more and more meteors Items, on the other hand, items give you abilities that are active while they're in your tableau. So if you have an item card over here, then when you play an item card, if you play this over here, uh, the green meeple, you'll get that benefit right away, which is move. But also you'll get this benefit until the card is reclaimed. Whenever you move through an opponent's uh, locations, that player gains Guile and you gain $1. So that could be a very helpful ongoing ability to help you as the player. But then additionally, when you actually build these, when you actually build an item, you're going to slot it into your board over here. And that's going to be an ongoing effect as well as giving you points at the end of the game. So you're effectively building up your tableau because your meteors get more powerful, your hearts and quests get more powerful and score you more points, and your items are going to be giving you ongoing abilities that are helpful. Past that, you're continuously wandering around the board. Now, when you wander to different locations, it's going to be an action that lets you vanquish tiles. Uh, one of your, my pet companion over here, lets me vanquish tile locations. So if I'm over here, I can go ahead and vanquish this location over here. So I can pay five guile. That's one of the reasons you want that guile. So if I have this guile over here, I can take the action, pay five guile, take this, put it on my board where it's gonna be worth two points and also be one of the seven tiles I need for this condition. But additionally, this spot is now unlocked. And generally, vanquish actions will also let you immediately activate the unlock spot as well. Not always. It's depends which card you have, but in general, you'll have that ability in play. And so you have that going as you start to explore the board and uncover more and more options and actions in the board. Those actions are going to be how you meld meteors and how you build items. Those are all going to be present as you explore the board. So over here, this is how you build an item. Over here, we have this one. And again, you'll be drawing tiles in the bag as you go. One of these tiles is one more. There's building an item, there's meteors, and there's another meteor over here. I'm trying to find one specific tile, which I should have just set up over here, but this tile over here. Over here, this action over here allows you to boast about your exploits. Uh, once you uncover this action, and again, remember, it will come out of the bag uncovered up at first, but once you uncover this action, you can use this action to say, look at that, I have four quests over here, and that's how I get that. So you have to be on that tile and taking a gathering action or vanquishing it and therefore activating it in order to get that done. But that is basically what you're going to be doing in Expeditions. Again, the turn structure is you're going to be taking a turn, uh, taking two actions, either move, play, or play, gather, or gather and move. Taking any two of those actions is a typical turn. Whenever you refresh, you'll get all three actions in play, and you're using those actions to explore the board, to move around, to go to the locations you need, to gather the cards that you want, so you can wander over here, so you can draw two cards and keep one. Or you can wander over here to take any one of the five cards in play. And then you're using the various abilities you have, and tons of abilities. All these cards, when you play these cards, there is a giant, giant amount of these cards in play, and you only see a small percentage of them game to game. If I have to guesstimate, I would say you're seeing maybe 25 to 35 percent of the cards in a game, which means there's a ton of variety as far as how the cards will combine and come out and play. And you're doing all of that while you try to vie towards four different victory conditions, four different ways to get those stars in play. So you can go ahead and lock these in, trigger end game, and earn points for how, earn points for how well you multiply your stars by your quests, as well as all your other factors as you try to build up the most efficient tableau in expeditions. Which brings to my review. Starting off with ease of play, and starting off, uh, ease of play, overall the game is fairly easy to get people up and running on. Uh, the rulebook's fairly fairly straightforward. Uh, Stone Mine games in general have excellent rulebooks, and this is no exception. I think they did a good job overall with just the... I, I, it's, a, it's a good game with a very simple... I'm saying this all wrong over here. The rules were very straightforward and clear, and the game is fairly easy to pick up and get people running on. Game time comes in at around 90 to 120 minutes. You can knock out a game in 60 minutes with two players who really know what's going on, but I'd say 90 to 120 is generally what the game is. And that game actually says 60 to 90, which 
means we're taking a little longer, but that makes sense, honestly. Table space, on the other hand, is a bit of an issue here. Not a major issue. It's not tremendously large, but over here, like, I'm already zoomed out. I already don't have the top row of tiles in. Let's go ahead and show you that so you can see everything. But that's what it would look like if I, like, zoomed out my whole situation there, which is manageable. It's not the end of the world, but it's certainly a little large. But more of an issue is that if you move things around, all the tiles kind of shift a bit. If I give a little, I'm, I'm going to hate myself for doing this, but if I go a little like that, you can see how everything kind of shifts and readjusting now requires doing all of this to get everything back in line. That was a small intentional misalignment as opposed to actually knocking things, which does happen in the game. Also, once you factor in every player having their player board, it can take up a little bit. It's not the worst, but more that movement thing is a slight irritation. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, starting off with what I like, which is the multiple pathways to victory here are just so present, both in terms of the general direction of quests versus items versus meteors, but also the sheer card variety at play. This is a tableau building game. This is a game where you're trying to build out your pathway forward. You're trying to figure out how to get the most points uh, as quickly as possible, as ideal as possible as you go through it. It is a, a very compelling engine that is just built. It, it, the, the core structure is very present and very well executed on, while also giving you such huge degrees of card variety that no two games play the same. You can't do the exact same pathway to victory every single time you play. You kind of might choose a direction as far as meteors or items or quests, and, and you'll be able to do multiple, but you're going to focus on one or two of those. But then from there, how things uh, shift and adjust is going to t depend dramatically on what cards are in play, how other players are dealing or going after the same cards, whether players are sweeping cards. There's some tiles over here that let you sweep the cards in play, and especially in a two-player game, that can be incredibly impactful if it denies players access to cards that they are clearly going for. If you have that one player who's trying to lock in their meteors, sweeping all the meteors off the table is... It feels petty, but it feels good and it feels mean and it's really actually a good move, especially in a two-player game, when it's directly everything you deny that one person is even more impactful to the other. But overall, this game has a lot of, of, of choice as far as how the players engage with the engine because of the sheer amount of cards and the way each one is incredibly impactful to what happens in the game. How you activate other tiles, how you can trash map tiles to get various effects, how you can pull back all your cards and get bonuses for pulling back cards. There are all, so many different things you can do in this game because you have every single card having a little ability that gets activated with a little worker as you go through it and there's just so many of them. And the game plays great at all player counts. I shouldn't say all player counts, I have not played this at 5. But at 2, 3, and 4 players, the game is excellent. So I also have not played the solo mode. But at 2, 3, and 4, the game is excellent. Uh, to me, 3 is probably the sweet spot. 2 is the fastest game. That's where you can knock it out faster, like in a 60-minute game and all that. But I would say that... I would say that... The two does have a little bit less interaction going on. The nature of the game is that it is low in player interaction, which we'll get to shortly. But that means that if you only have like one other mech blocking tiles, uh, you're not going to have that many times where you're blocked. There will be times. There will be times where your other player blocks you, but not as many. In a three and four player game, blocking is more frequent, but also you're not getting that much increased interaction and you are adding extra downtime. So for me, as usual, three is pretty ideal as far as how to play this, but I like this at two, three, and four. And I, I'd, be, I'd be willing to play it at five. I don't think it would be my preferred player count but I'd certainly be willing to give it a go. But the game, entire game is just very puzzly as far as how you approach it. And the, the overall playtime to depth ratio in this game is just very well done. Again, you can knock out a game in 90 minutes fairly consistently, and what it gives you in that choice and that... In that and that way you approach it in those 90 minutes and the amount of things you're trying to balance as you figure out which of these scoring goals are you going for. Because you're going to want to focus on things. You want to focus on quests combined with, you know, maybe getting a bunch of these vanquishing questions and a whole handful of cards because a large handful of cards means you have to refresh less often. But maybe refreshing more often to get the right cards at the right time is better. And there's so many different ways you're trying to figure out how to move forward in this game. Which stars to get, which pathways to pursue, how to explore the map, making sure you explore the map enough that you get those key tiles in place. If you can't build meteors, you can't take a meteor strategy. If you don't ever boast, you won't actually win and trigger the end game. And so you're trying to figure out how to explore this pathway while you combining the cards and their vast amounts of ability in just a very well-balanced, lots of fun to explore engine of just improving your tableau, scoring as many points as possible. Those meteors are incredibly satisfying, but so are the items. Generally, when I play this game, I always get some quests, but I almost always focus on either items or meteors. They are both so much fun to try to pursue. Items power up the ways you can explore and do things in the game. And meteors just escalate so nicely as you play that playing your fourth or your fifth meteor, if you have that asymmetric faction, playing your fifth meteor is a lot of fun. You can get so many points from that. It's just, you have to work for 
but you can get a lot out of it. Speaking of which, I like the asymmetric factions. You're going to have asymmetric factions as far as what the mechs do, as well as what your leader and uh, companion do, and the combination of them will give you a slight degree of asymmetry. Not majorly game-breaking, but definitely impactful as far as the ways you're going to pursue things. Getting a fifth meteor sounds incredibly cool, but you know what's also cool? Being able to da being able to take cards directly into your hand when you gather them and acquire them for the first time, because it saves you that cycle of having to recall things. So everything is a little bit cool in terms of how it operates and what it does, but it gives you those different pathways to explore, which is what I like so much about expeditions as far as what i don't like in the game the text on the cards is tiny this is actually a genuine problem i have with the game i don't know necessarily the best way to solve it and it is one that gets better as you play but when you have like four players around the table from different angles trying to read the text on this card i mean at this point i know the game better and i know the card i can read what it says at a glance but when you're starting off some of these cards and some of them are obfuscated by the images too like this card over here the image kind of gets in the way of reading it over as well and so the card readability over here is really not the best. We got tiny icons on the side, tiny text, and all of that is doable but manageable when you're looking at it head on and you know the game. It becomes much harder to deal with when you're looking at it from the side and it's your first time playing. So the card text, I, I wish, I wish that was so, 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 so much better as you play through it. I also have minor quibbles that don't really affect things at all. Like that, the, the card text thing is a genuine complaint. I wish it was better. I have some minor quibbles that are uh, worth addressing or noting, but don't really impact my enjoyment. Uh, first of all, I'll say that the game structure is that when you pull tiles from a bag, when you uncover a tile, let's say we pull a tile here, we place it down, we got a three, we need to get to at least five, so we're going to pull another one out. So over here, we got a four, and you cover it up. Strictly speaking, this is the way you cover up a tile, which means you have to remember what's underneath it. And yes, you can see the outline, but again, first-time players will have a hard time struggling with that. But also, am I supposed to remember that the three is there? Because it's not a hidden information game. You're allowed to look, but now we have the structure. I kind of just, information is obscured through the gameplay. That's an easily solvable thing. What I do when I play is I just stack them like this. You have to get to the four before the three, but you just stack them, and it's all good. Everything's visible. That has worked just fine for us. And then lastly, I'll say that the game kind of takes a slightly, um, I don't even know if it's Cthulhu-esque vibe to it. They got like this whole tentacle thing and dark and corruption and these people are being in some way uh, engaged in dark. I don't know exactly what's going on. And to me, the theme, the theme adjustment as far as, again, there's literally, where's the tentacle person? We got hands. I don't even know where it's here. Maybe it's the side of the box. So somewhere in the box. There's somewhere where we got tentacle hands person. I can't find it. Maybe it's somewhere else, but I know these purple guys, these purple guys over here, like that's their like tentacles and whatnot, and you can see it on certain cards. I, I guess you generally could, and now I'm going to be stuck trying to find all the, I could have sworn it's on the front of the box. Where is it? Is it here? No, it's not on the front. There's, there's a bit of an undercurrent. Oh, we got, we got a little tentacle. Here we go. Here we go. This is one of the things. So over here, you can see this over here. That guy over there, that's a little tentacle creature. And there's more of those. If you look around the board and the art, you can find these things present. But there's some sort of like a Cthulhu-esque thing going on in this world, which to me just feels a drop out of place. Now, it's not present enough. Again, it's hidden enough in the art and theme that you can kind of ignore its existence. But that's the nature of the corruption, of the purple meeples that you earn, of this sort of darkness on these tiles. And it just, to me, it feels a little bit out of place. Not a big deal, but just a small little note. As far as what I can see others not liking... First of all, this game can take a game or two to get up and running. A big part of that is because of the small text on the cards. It gets in the way. But it can take a, a game to like kind of... I think the first game is almost a write-off game. You'll learn the game. It's very easy to understand what's happening. But then actually playing, it's like a different way to approach it. And that first game, almost considered a write-off to just learning the game. And then your second game is where you actually start to play and have a bit more intent as to what you're actually doing as you go through it. And then secondly, I'll say this game is very much a heads-down game. This is a game which you have your own thing going on, you're working on your own puzzle, and the other players minimally interact with you. There is interaction. There's a little bit of interaction. There's some cards here and there that will do things. Uh, there's the fact that you will be blocking each other by taking various spots. And there will be times where the other player's presence in your game will be annoying. They'll sweep cards that you want. They'll take the card that you want. They'll be in the spot that you want. That will happen. But for the most part, you're mostly doing your own thing while you work towards victory, as everyone else does their own thing. To me, that does not take away from my enjoyment of the game, but if you want a higher degree of player interaction, I don't think Expeditions is for you. As far as final thoughts on Expeditions, I really like this game. Like, I really, really like this game. I, 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 I don't know if I convey... I think I spent too much time in the what I like section just talking about the multiple pathways to victory and all the cards and all the ways the cards just change the way you approach it, but I don't think that fully conveys how much I've enjoyed playing through Expeditions. And I'm not someone who loved the original Scythe. I was always okay with Scythe. Scythe is a good game and a lot of people love it and I'm happy for them and I've always enjoyed it. 
And this to me was a game that I was less looking forward to because it was the successor to Scythe, but it's a totally different experience. And it's an experience that works so much more for me in terms of what I like in games. This to me has that puzzly feeling that I often seek out in games, that, that puzzly feeling of trying to take into account different factors and criteria as I charge forward towards victory and try to find the pattern that gives me the, the best point optimization as I go through the experience. And the variety of cars means every single game of Expeditions I've played has felt different in terms of the way I'm forced to approach it within the same construct of the rules, but just different ways to approach the engine. For me, this is a five out of five. The degree of the variety of player count, the fact that I enjoy it so much at two, three, and four players, the fact that it plays in 90 minutes fairly consistently once you know what's going on, and again, even 60 minutes at a two player game, the fact that it gives you so much variety to the way you interact with the game state. There are minor quibbles I have with the game, but the game design I am really enjoying, having a lot of fun with, and I'm I like it a lot. I like this game a lot. To me, this is a 5 out of 5. I really enjoy this one. Uh, this is Expeditions from Stormy Games, and I highly recommend it if you like that kind of thing. Speaking of if you like that kind of thing, if you're looking for other game recommendations, first of all, Scythe is going to be an obvious comparison in the sense that, uh, you know, it has uh, overlaps in the theme, it has overlaps in some small elements of the gameplay, while being very different, a uh, very different beast. But if you're looking for things that give me that same puzzly feeling, I'll give you two. First of all, the loop. I've always enjoyed the loop. It's a cooperative experience, so different than Expeditions, but I love the way you're kind of forced to puzzle through certain things as you play through that game, as you take in different pieces of information, different cards, move around the board, and try to stop the uh, various things from exploding in your face too many times. And if you're looking for the game that this feels most similar to me, Vindication. Vindication from Orange Nebula is a game that has that same competitive, puzzly feel as you go through a handful of cards every single game and a giant stack of cards as you try to take into account their abilities and the overall construct of the game and try to puzzle your way towards the most efficient scoring optimization. That's Vindication from Orange Nebula. In any case, then until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Hope you found this video helpful, and as always, I hope you have a good one.